Welcome to this live stream. This is Mr. Loggerway coming to you from West Michigan. We're talking some A push today, talking about the election of 1800 as a turning point. Um, so just to give you a sense of where we're going here again, I said we're going to do the before, the during, the after. So the road to 1800 itself, and so the road to 1800, the election itself, and then the elections aftermath. That's kind of what we're going to go about. Uh, Alyssa, hey, fantastic. Let's do it. Uh, we're getting excited about the election of 1800, which is sometimes called a revolution. Uh, one of the big questions that I want you to keep in mind as we talk about this this evening is, is the election of 1800 actually a revolution? Jefferson calls it a revolution, but is he mistaken? How much actually changes and how big of a deal is it? There's a variety of reasons why it could be considered a big deal, uh, but we'll talk about those as we go. So let's start off with the road to 1800. On the right-hand side there, we have an electoral college presidential election map, and we need to talk about some of the parties. One of the things that I want to make sure that we get here is that sometimes people mix up the anti-federalists and the democratic republicans. Easy thing to mix up, so uh, no, no shame there if you've done this before, but just a reminder, the federalists and the anti-federalists, they exist initially during the 1780s as they debate the constitution and its ratification. The Federalists are those that appreciate the federalized and federal system of government set up by the Constitution, and thus the Constitution is written in 1787, ratified 1787 to 1788, and then the Federalist Party largely goes away, although the people who have those views still are sticking around. Same thing with the Anti-Federalists. You really don't want to be talking about the Anti-Federalists if it's after 1789, because that's when George Washington is inaugurated, and there, there no longer are any issues for them to be uniting against, so there's no constitutional ratification question. But the same people that are in the anti-federalist camp, many of them will begun, begin shifting into the Democratic-Republican camps after 1793. Keep in mind a good example of someone who is both a federalist in terms of the pro-ratification of the Constitution and a Democratic-Republican is going to be James Madison. Remember, he's one of the three authors of the Federalist Papers. Ooh, brief bonus question for you folks right here. In the chat, who are the other two authors of the Federalist Papers besides James Madison? James Madison wrote, writes some of them. Dominique's got John Jay. Vicky's got John Jay. And we got Hamilton. Fantastic. Nice job. Yeah, Abofu, Ashley, Arthi. Nice job. Nice job. So you, you got that one down. That's good. Um, those three guys write the Federalist Papers, which argue for ratification of the Constitution. James Madison is in favor of the Constitution. He's also going to be really important for early, early administrative stuff in the legislative branch during the Washington administration. But he's also not a huge fan of the Hamilton plan. So once we get past like Jay's treaty and Hamilton's financial plan, more on that in the later streams, uh, then you're going to start to get some, some opposition to Washington's administration and particularly Hamilton's plan. So if you're talking about political parties that are after Washington gets inaugurated, you probably want to be talking about the Democratic Republicans and not the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists are a thing. Remember, they're still a party, but they've sort of, they're sort of the early Federalists, a.k.a. pro-Constitution, and the later Federalists, a.k.a. pro-Hamilton's financial plan. Uh, there's a, a series of things we could talk about there. Just remember the, the Federalists tend to be a bit more elitist. They tend to be focused in New England, as we can see in that map right there, and they tend to be more in favor of a mixed economy and not as much agrarian, but they're okay with a larger government to take care of state revenue, whiskey taxes, things like that. Um, and then, so we have those parties starting to emerge. That's important. We have the election of 1796, which you can see right there on the screen. Uh, notice that is between what two people, Jefferson and Adams. Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, our important ambassador to France during the Revolutionary War, and John Adams, who was uh, Washington's vice president and thus seen as sort of the heir apparent. Those guys slug it out. Adams wins just barely, actually, in that one. And he becomes president, but because we had not passed the 12th Amendment yet, the second place finisher in the Electoral College gets to be the vice president, which leads to this very awkward situation where Adams, a Federalist, is president, and Jefferson, a Democratic Republican, is the vice president. That's a little awkward. So Jefferson is going to be working against Adams kind of from within his own administration. And so the election of 1796 is kind of the first battle between those two guys. The Adams presidency is part of the road to 1800. Adams is a pres is president from 1797 when he gets inaugurated in March until March of 1801 when Jefferson is inaugurated. Spoiler alert, Jefferson wins the election of 1800. So Adams is president for about four years and 
during that time, there are some big issues that are going to lead to his defeat in 1800. So if you want to understand 1800 as a turning point, we should probably talk about what happens during the Adams administration. So again, let's throw this in the chat. What are some important events that happened during the Adams administration that potentially could lead to people either really liking him or really disliking him? Let's see. We got that XYZ affair. Hopefully your teacher has shown you the the French opera video. If not, uh, look it up. The election of 18, uh, the XYZ affair on YouTube. It's this old animated video. Hilarious. XYZ affair. We'll talk about what that is in just a second. I'm just trying to see if there's anybody else who has. Ah, okay. Fantastic. Let's talk about the XYZ affair real quick. So during Adams's presidency, uh, one of the big issues is going to be what do we do with the French Revolution, right? Uh, Washington had decided to stay neutral during the French Revolution, but the French and the British are pretty much constantly at war during this time period, and we're kind of caught in the middle. We would like to be neutral. We would like to be able to trade with both countries, and yet we're not able to do so because they don't want us to trade with the other country. So the XYZ affair is when we send some negotiators over to France to say, hey, could you maybe not attack our ships and take our sailors? And they say, well, we will only negotiate with you if you give us a bribe. And the three people that delivered that message, because we didn't want to publicly shame them about it, we called them, referred to them as X, Y, and Z. So the XYZ affair is when France tries to get us to pay them a bribe in order to negotiate to stop attacking our ships. And we say, yeah, not going to work. And the, the famous phrase is millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. In other words, we're not going to pay you a bribe. We'd rather spend way more money fighting ourselves uh, or fighting you off ourselves with our own Navy. So the XYZ affair is rather important. And then keep in mind, this is happening within the larger context of what is sometimes called the quasi-war. The quasi-war, which is pictured on the right there, it's an undeclared naval war. It's not official. Nobody declares war. But France is kind of attacking us. We fight back because we're trying to trade with the British and the French. And the British don't, uh, sorry, the French don't like that. So we're going to have all kinds of problems with the French during this time period, known as the quasi-war. The XYZ affair is just one incident uh, you could also talk about the Citizen Genet affair. Um, you could talk about, well, of course, yeah, Vicky mentions it. Yeah, the Alien and Sedition Act. Uh, that is a big deal, and we're going to need to talk about that. So the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, Bofuth, good thing we can cover that XYZ affair. Hopefully you're doing okay then. Yeah, thanks for the question. Again, if you have more questions, feel free to put those in the Ask a Question function down below or in the chat. Either one, I'll see them, and I'll, I'll do my best to help you folks out. So the Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, Alien and Sedition Acts are passed by the Adams administration and supported by Federalists in Congress. And it's mostly designed to limit the power of the Democratic Republicans. It's sort of an emergency wartime measure. So the Alien Act says that you can't vote if you're new to the United States because a lot of new immigrants voted Democratic Republican. It also, the Sedition Act makes it uh, illegal against the law to criticize the government or the president. And so maybe it's kind of contradicting that First Amendment there. So the Alien and Sedition Acts are vastly unpopular. A few newspaper editors are jailed under this thing, and people start to really turn against Adams, including, of course, Thomas Jefferson, his own vice president, and James Madison. By the way, here's another thing to add and another thing to answer in the chat below. Uh, Vicky, you already got to it. Man, you folks are so good. No wonder you said 10 out of 10. Um, Madison and Jefferson are going to secretly, because they can't be seen to be doing this publicly, secretly author a series of resolutions called the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. Now, again, the, this is, we're getting to the point where there's a lot of this complicated legal theory that's going on, but basically this is how it works. Um, the Alien and Sedition Acts, some people thought that they were unconstitutional, which arguably they probably were. So if they're unconstitutional, how do you get rid of them? Well, they, there was this legal theory that said maybe the states can stop the federal government because we have this federalized system where there's a national and state governments, they both share power. Maybe the states could inter intervene and make sure that the federal government is not doing things that are unconstitutional. So they author these resolutions passed by the Virginia and Kentucky legislatures of the state that say the Alien and Sedition Acts are null and void. They do not exist. They, they, in our state, we will not enforce them. They're unconstitutional. That was one theory as to how a law could be struck down as unconstitutional. The other theory, of course, is going to be the judicial theory, judicial review. We'll get there later with, with Marbury v. Madison. So Alien and Sedition Acts, very unpopular. The Quasi-War, actually, Adams helps to end the Quasi-War and negotiates an end to it. But unfortunately, it's been a little bit uh, too late for Adams because of the Alien and Sedition Acts. They make him unpopular, and we get to 1800 with uh, Adams is not looking so great. 
Thanks for stopping by. All right. We got the HQ stopping by. All right. So that's the road to 1800. Let's take a brief apple cider break because it is the fall and it's always important to stay hydrated, right? All right. So in case you want to get a quick sense of the timeline here, again, the road to 1800 looks a little bit like this. So Washington's inaugurated in 1789. He serves two terms, but not a full eight years. Adams is elected in 1796. He serves one four-year term. And then we have the election of 1800 coming up uh, right after the quasi-war finishes. We'll look at the rest of that timeline a little bit later. All right. So the election of 1800 is Jefferson versus Adams round two. Remember, John Adams is a Federalist. Thomas Jefferson is a Democrat or Republican. Those are their uh, tricolored cockades right there, in case you were wondering. Notice the one on the right looks a whole lot like the French tricolor, and that's no coincidence. The Democratic Republicans really like France. They did not like the quasi-war. They did not like the Alien and Sedition Acts. They did not like the fact that Washington uh, committed to neutrality. They wanted to actually help the French, who, remember, helped us during the, French, uh, during the American Revolution. So the main issues, as we've already talked about during this election, are going to be the French Revolution responses. How do we respond? Do we help the French? Do we not? Do we trade with the British? Do we not? And then the Alien and Sedition Acts. The Alien and Sedition Acts are going to make John Adams really unpopular. It's seen as too much government overreach. Remember, if you remember uh, Jefferson and, and Hamilton arguing about Hamilton's financial plan, Thomas Jefferson is more of a strict constructionist. He thinks the government should only do what is explicitly in the Constitution, and he'll argue that things like creating a national bank is just too big. And so big government is a really big concern for him. He wants small-scale local government to serve small-scale local people. Agrarian society, as Dominic was mentioning. Dominic, nice job. Yeah, absolutely. An agrarian society. Uh, not a whole lot of international trade, mostly just small farmers. And then uh, Thomas Jefferson is is going to uh, accuse John Adams of, of also increasing the size of the federal government through the, those Alien and Sedition Acts. Uh, Bofu is asking, is there anything else that made John Adams uh, famous or less unpopular? Um, yeah, uh, John Adams is famous for a lot of things. I mean, he is heavily, heavily involved in early colonial history. And so he's going to be, he, remember, he's the lawyer who defends the British soldiers accused in the Boston Massacre. He's going to be heavily involved in the Declaration of Independence, some of the Continental Congress stuff. He's going to serve as our minister overseas to England during the Revolutionary War and as some of the aftermath. And so he's not there for the Constitutional Convention, but he is integral to early American history. Highly recommend that HBO series, John Adams, that, uh, the miniseries that came out a few years ago. Um, if that's something that you have access to, uh, it's, it does a pretty good job. Paul Giamatti does a great John Adams. So John Adams is a big deal. I mean, he wrote a whole bunch of um, he wrote a whole bunch of books that were all about uh, governmental style that they used during the Constitutional Convention, and that's great. And then he's he's George Washington's vice president. I'm getting there to his presidency. Yep, um, he's vice president for George Washington, but uh, doesn't do a whole lot because it's it's kind of confusing as to what the vice president's role is. He presides over the Senate, but it's confusing. And then eventually he becomes president in his own right. Um, in terms of what what makes him famous during his presidency, uh, there's not a whole lot going on that we need to worry about for a push other than the the quasi war alien and sedition acts. Those are those are pretty much the big highlights. The foreign policy of getting stuck between France and England is going to be the huge overwhelming highlight of early America. And Adams is just absolutely crushed in the middle. There's the occasional border skirmish with Native Americans out west toward the Northwest Territories. Uh, there's going to be some domestic problems with possibly raising an army to be able to fight the French. So there's some internal struggles there, but largely for our purposes in a push, I would just know about the alien sedition acts and the whole French revolution quasi war thing. That'd be kind of your highlights there. All right. So then the election of 1800, let's find out how this happens. I already told you that Jefferson wins. So no surprise there. Jefferson picks up a few extra electoral votes versus the last time, by the way, if you, Ooh, Maybe this would be a good another bonus question. Why do some of those southern states have such a large representation? Virginia is the largest state, but I would argue that a lot of those southern states' electoral college numbers are artificially boosted. Yes, slaves, the three-fifths compromise. You can actually do the math here, and some historians have, that if the three-fifths compromise had not existed, Adams actually would have won this election. So the only reason that Jefferson wins is because of slaves, slaveholding states, and that three-fifths compromise, that infamous compromise where we count uh, people that are enslaved as, as three-fifths of a person for electoral college and representational purposes. 
So Jefferson wins. He wins the Electoral College 73 to 65, which seems pretty close. But then you look at some of the totals of who's voting. And remember, this is before universal white manhood suffrage. So we still have a lot of property qualifications. It's only white males and it's largely ones who have property. But if you look at the popular vote there, Jefferson has a clear advantage, right? And he also win, wins some of the, those big swing states, including Maryland and New York, which are going to be really important during the early Republican years. Uh, there's a couple of side stories. Again, I don't. Uh, some of this is just interesting, and it might be somewhat useful for you. But in, in terms of big picture, a push. I don't want us to get too bogged down in some of these details. But there are some interesting things, like the drama with Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr is not only known for just shooting Alexander Hamilton in a duel in a few years. He's also Jefferson's vice presidential running mate. And back then, again, this is before the 12th Amendment, which sets up our election systems the way they work today. And so you had two votes and you were supposed to use one for the president, one for the vice president. And then the second place finisher takes the, the vice presidency. But the problem was all the Democratic Republican people voted with one vote for Jefferson and one for Burr. So they both ended up with the same electoral college totals, which is a bit of a problem because you can't have two people. So then... They had to decide Burr or Jefferson, and this was decided by the, the previous and about to be kicked out of office legislature, which is chock full of Federalists. So the Federalists have to decide, oh, great, which of our opponents are we going to choose to be the next president? And if you're familiar with the musical Hamilton, this is the election of 1800, uh, which is actually depicted behind me in a poster that some of my students got me. Shout out to those people that are watching. And uh, we have... Uh, Hamilton actually influencing a lot of the legislature to be able to say, you know what, uh, I would rather have Jefferson be president than than Burr, so let's go with Jefferson. And that ends up being one of the reasons why Burr doesn't like Hamilton so much. They've clashed over a lot of things, uh, but that's one of them. So there's some drama with Burr. Burr then becomes vice president, and Jefferson, who is really mad at Burr for this whole tie and openly campaigning against him and things like that, uh, Jefferson kind of sidelines him for much of his presidency and then we'll drop him on his next ticket and as hannah is mentioning yes there are those burr conspiracies uh he has some crazy wacko stories uh feel free to look those up later we're not necessarily going to cover them right now but needless to say burr does some crazy things about westward territory and possible secession and he's arrested and charged with treason but not found guilty so just crazy stories uh but for our purposes here just remember the election of 1800 a little bit crazy and the 12th amendment is one that's worth knowing just because it changes our elections and makes them how they are a little bit more today, where you have one vote for president, one vote for vice president, and they're very different. You can't, you just don't have two electoral votes. You have to vote with, for people as a pair. And then last thing to mention here with the election of 1800 would be the midnight judges. Something that's a little bit important to, to a push history, only for a few elections, is that what month do elections happen in US, in US history and in the United States today? Go ahead and drop that in the chat if you know that one. In what month? Do we have presidential elections? Ah, uh, yes, November. Good, good, good. So we know that uh, presidential elections happen the first Tuesday in November. And then when is the presidential inauguration? Go ahead and drop that in the chat if you think you know it. Ah, we're all saying January, which is true in 2019 and will be true in 2021. However, back then, Dominique's got it. It was in March. Yes, back then it was in March. And that's going to play a role in a couple different key elections. This is actually going to be one of them uh, because so much of this is going to happen last minute. What, by the way, one of the reasons why it's nice to have the inauguration in March in, is in, uh, in this time period is that we uh, have a lot of traveling problems. And so we're going to have to make sure that we can get everyone, the Electoral College together. We can get the, the presidency there. And Zachary, yes, thanks for the correction. Yeah, it's the first Tuesday after the first Monday. Yeah, you can't have the early, early Tuesday for the for the election, for sure. Yeah, thanks for <laughs> pointing that out. Forgot about forgot to mention that. Um, so the, when the inauguration is in March, it means that there's this weird session between November and March where John Adams is still the president, and yet he's about to be gone. And so he has a unique title. Anybody know what that title is? What's it called when a politician is still in power but they're about to be gone because they're either retiring or they've been not reelected. Vicky's got it, lame duck. This will be important later when we talk about FDR and how with the uh, how we change this with uh, a constitutional amendment. So the midnight judges, going back to that, uh, John Adams 
as president, one of the checks and balances is that the president gets to appoint judges to the judiciary. So this is going to be federal judges. And because John Adams is a federalist, he's going to be appointing a bunch of federalist judges. He does some of this at the last moment. Those are confirmed by the Senate, and they're done at the last minute, kind of like when you turn in the, that paper at 11.59 p.m., right? So that's called that's what's known as the midnight judges. He makes a whole bunch of last-minute appointments. That's going to be important. Tuck it away. Uh, let me pause right here for any questions that we have so far. So we talked about the road to 1800, the John Adams is presidency, uh, the starting of fighting between the two different political parties, the Federalists, the Democratic Republicans, the election itself, Jefferson wins, and he beats Adams in round two. And Abofu is asking about the Judiciary Act. Yeah, so the Judiciary Act was passed 1789, I believe. Somebody feel free to check me on that. But the Judiciary Act, that's the one that uh, is passed by a bunch of Federalists. It's passed by, it's signed into law by George Washington and passed by Congress. And basically it enables the federal government to be able to create a whole bunch of additional uh, courts all over the, the country. So the Constitution says that the Congress has to, uh, there has to be a, a uh, Supreme Court, but then Congress is able to set up other courts underneath as needed. And that was the Judiciary Act that sort of set up the other court systems. Uh, yeah, not a problem at all. You, you didn't miss it. Um, so the Judiciary Act is just set up. Now, now that's going to be important, and we're going to talk about that when it comes to Marbury v. Madison, uh, because that'll, that'll be part of that is the law that's, that's then struck down. So, election of 1800. Um, one of the couple reasons, if there are any other questions, feel free to put those in there. Thanks for asking a question there, Abofu. Um, we have the election of 1800 as, as a turning point for a couple of reasons. One, it is the first transfer of power between political parties. George Washington, arguably a Federalist, kind of not affiliated with a party. And then it goes to Adams, who was his vice president, and arguably also a Federalist, was a Federalist. Um, but then this is a clear change of power between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. And there were some really, really big concerns about is Adams going to give up power, right? This whole experiment in democracy hadn't been tried before. And so are they going to somehow Federalists going to cling to power? Are they going to pass more things like the Alien Sedition Act? Are they going to interfere in the election? Are they going to try to stop Jefferson from having more power? Are they going to try to strip the presidency of power before they leave? all kinds of interesting shenanigans that could have happened. And it turns out that there is a peaceful transition of power. Adams doesn't try to cling to power. There's no coup. Uh, Jefferson doesn't have to force his way into the White House. And I know we kind of take that for granted nowadays, uh, but back then this was a big deal. It was a big concern. And a lot of people were really concerned, uh, particularly because Jefferson was known for being a little bit heterodox in his Christianity. He had some unusual beliefs. And so they were like, they, they were thinking, oh man, this guy's a little bit weird. He's got some crazy religious beliefs. Maybe he'll do some terrible stuff. And boy, you want to talk about a mudslinging election. The election of 1800 was a mudslinging election. All kinds of nasty things sent back and forth, right? Um, so, by the way, you should look up a YouTube video that's uh, attack ads of 1800. Someone took actual quotes from the election of 1800 campaigns and then made them into modern day attack ads. And oh boy, yeah. Uh, they did not. They did not mince their words. They went after each other. So they were saying John Adams when he isn't trying to marry off one of his daughters to King George and importing mistresses. Uh, he's he's trying to make us into a monarchy, and he's got all sorts of conspiracies. Oh no! And then Jefferson, if Jefferson was elected, the air will be rent with the screaming of children and women getting killed and. And people are going to get abused, and there's going to be blood everywhere, and like awful, weird cult practices are going to be openly preached, just over the top stuff. And this is the election of 1800, and so people were, were certainly really invested in this, and were genuinely worried that Jefferson was going to take us in some sort of really odd or terrible direction. Yeah, sounds like a lot of fun. Um, yeah, they they were certainly going after each other in the press, and uh, it's kind of what happens today. So in case you hear people say like, oh man, this is the worst presidential election ever in terms of the rhetoric. Ah, yeah, rhetoric could be better, but it was also pretty bad, bad, bad back then too. So that's the election of 1800. Let's talk a little bit about the aftermath then, because remember, if we're talking about whether it's a turning point or not, we got to talk about the before and the after as well and then compare the two. So let's talk about the, the aftermath of the election of 1800. Upper right-hand corner, what's that a picture of? Go ahead and throw that in the chat if you think you know what it is. 
Vicky's got it. Nice job. The Louisiana Purchase. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the Louisiana Purchase, and that's going to be in 1803. And then down below in the lower right-hand corner, we have a picture of what? Notice the nine chairs that are there in front of the pillow, pillars. Anybody have a guess as to what that is? It's not just any court. It is, as Vicky was saying, the Supreme Court. Yes. Nice job. Uh, by the way, there is nothing in the Constitution that says there have to be nine justices. That's just how it's come to be over time and by custom. And some people are proposing that we change it, right? Some 2020 candidates are talking about that. But largely in American history, in the modern sense, especially after the 20th century, uh, it's been nine justices on the Supreme Court. So we'll talk about that. All right. So the Louisiana Purchase is made in 1803. Why am I bringing this up? Well, partially, this is talking about why the Jeffersonian presidency is important. Give you some brief highlights of Jefferson in office. Uh, but also because the Louisiana Purchase is pretty constitutionally sketchy. Is there anything in the Constitution that says the president can buy territory from other countries and add it on to the United States? Uh, not really. No, says Vicky, And she's indeed correct. There's nothing in the Constitution that says this. And remember, Jefferson back when he was not in power, was always harping on Adams and Hamilton and Washington for doing things that were considered unconstitutional because they were not explicitly in the Constitution. Remember, as a Democratic Republican, he is allegedly a strict constructionist. And remember, they also passed the 10th Amendment that says any additional powers not explicitly granted to the federal government should by default go to the states. There's a bit of a tension in there, right? There's a bit of a tension between the 10th Amendment and the necessary and proper clause. Sometimes called the elastic clause too. Um, we have this idea of the federal government can do whatever is necessary and proper to carry out its functions. And would the but would buying land like this be be necessary and proper? Maybe. But what, notice once Jefferson gets in power, suddenly he starts using that power in a way that he previously had criticized. So whether that's hypocrisy or that's just being practical, that's up for us to decide. He goes from being a strict constructionist to a loose constructionist. Yeah, um, a, little, a little bit. Yeah, he, he still has those principles, but there are some times when he kind of bends the rules a little bit. Yeah. Um, we do buy the Louisiana Purchase from France. We buy it from Napoleon so they can pay for the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, this is this happens after the giant slave revolts on Saint-Domingue, otherwise known as Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. And uh, France is rather cash-strapped, and Napoleon kind of gives up on his ideas of a North American territory. By the way, this was taken from Spain, actually. The French took this territory from Spain because Napoleon was taking over Spain, and then they sold it to us, which is actually kind of sketchy because Napoleon had promised not to sell it to anybody else, and yet he did anyway. So Louisiana Purchase. The reason we're mentioning this is because Jefferson kind of stretches the power of the presidency and perhaps goes back on some of his own original strict constructionist principles. We also have Marbury v. Madison, and this is a famous Supreme Court case. This is a must-know Supreme Court case. Marbury v. Madison happens the same year. And notice, by the way, that this is Mr. James Madison and Mr. Marbury, who was a judge, who was a midnight judge. And James Madison was the Secretary of State for Jefferson. And he was ordered to give the judge papers authorizing him to be a judge to Mr. Marbury. Madison refused. Marbury sued. And it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And as Vicki already said in the chat, because she's a 10 out of 10 on top of it, fantastic, judicial review. So here's what happens. The chief justice at the time, John Marshall, sees an opportunity and an opening, but also recognizes there's some danger. If he just orders Madison to give Marbury his judgeship, Madison could refuse, and the Supreme Court looks powerless and kind of silly. If he decides to let Madison do whatever he wants, then what's the point of the Supreme Court still? And also keep in mind, John Marshall is a Federalist. And so he thinks that there should be a, a co-equal branches and thinks Marbury should become a judge. There's some partisan ideas there too. So what he does is he threads, he threads a needle kind of between these two and says, all right, how about this? Parts of the Judiciary Act are unconstitutional because they go too far. So Madison, you should have given it to him, but the law, the part of the law that says you have to give it to him is also unconstitutional. So we're going to can cancel out that law because the Supreme Court does have the authority to review laws. So this is what's known as judicial review, as in judges reviewing, rating, checking over, and seeing, is this law constitutional? By the way, this is rather rare in American history during the early republic. In fact, this is a, ooh, this is a bonus, bonus, bonus question for you. You're probably not here yet. 
what is the next time that the Supreme Court is going to use judicial review to strike down a law to make it unconstitutional? If you think you know, go ahead and put it in the chat. Uh, so Abofu, let me let me talk about this one more time here. Kind of, it's, it's, it's a lot of complications, but big picture here. Um, Mr. Marbury was given a judgeship by John Adams. Remember, John Adams was about to leave. He was appointing all these justices last minute before he has to be not president anymore. And he, he wrote out a letter that says, make Mr. Marbury a judge. And then was going to, and then put it on the desk and the Senate approved it. But the letter had not been delivered. James Madison, once Jefferson gets inaugurated, becomes the Secretary of State and is in charge of delivering those letters. James Madison says, oh, look, Marbury needs to be a judge. He's a Federalist. I disagree with him. Let's not give him that letter so he can't be a judge. And then Marbury says, hey, where's my letter, man? And then he sues and it goes to the Supreme Court. So does Madison have to give Marbury the judgeship? That, that's, that's a little bit more detail than perhaps you need to know, but that's okay. Uh, Marbury v. Madison establishes the idea of judicial review because it's going to say the Supreme Court can decide if the Judiciary Act is constitutional or not. And this helps to establish the, the Supreme Court of the United States as a co-equal branch. Before this, they were not doing a whole lot. They were seen as kind of a joke. They met in the basement of Congress. And this establishes the Supreme Court as a third branch of government that has just as much power as the other two branches, or at least has some power. So John Marshall is appointed by John Adams and becomes the chief justice. And then he, he is on the court for years for about 30 years or so. And he's a Federalist. So even though the Federalist Party disintegrates, and we'll talk about it in just a second, uh, there is this Chief Justice, John Marshall, who believes in an expansive view of government, who believes in loose constructionism, and he's going to enforce a lot of these uh, laws, and he's going to make a lot of very important early decisions that perhaps you will talk about later. Uh, McCulley v. Maryland, Dartmouth v. Woodward, things like that. But that's for another time and another stream. So Marbury v. Madison is a big deal. So that would be one reason why the election of 1800 could be considered big, because that comes right out of there. We also have the first Barbary Wars. And, um, oh, 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 sorry, Ashley, you caught me. You caught me. Yeah, yeah, what's the next case? Let me fix this typo as we talk about this. I wanted to give people a chance to be able to uh, put it in the chat. The Barbary Wars are going to go until 1805, so we need to change that from 1801 to 1805. The next case that uses... Judicial review is going to be Dred Scott v. Sanford in 1857. Vicky's got it. Oh, Vicky, be honest. Did you look it up or did you know that? <laughs> um, 1857, the Dred Scott case is going to declare the Missouri Compromise. Hey, nice job. Oh, kudos to you. Good job. Good job. Round of applause. Um, Dred Scott v. Sanford is going to declare the Missouri Compromise to be unconstitutional. If you haven't gotten to the Missouri Compromise yet, don't worry about it. It has to do with free and slave states. But either way, that's the next case, Dred Scott v. Sanford. By the way, just fun fact, I got to actually see Dred Scott's um, tomb, which is in St. Louis, Missouri. I got to see that this past weekend. Uh, people leave pennies on top as a bit of a tribute to him because uh, pennies, of course, have Lincoln, who eventually freed all the slaves. So 1857 is the next time. So it's going to be 54 years before the Supreme Court's going to strike down another law as unconstitutional. So judicial review is used very rarely. Nowadays, it's used all the time, right? We're used to like, oh, the Supreme Court struck down this law from this state or this law from uh, declared President Trump's whatever. On, uh, yeah, it happens all the time now, but back then it was a little bit more rare. But this is the first time it happens, and it establishes a really, really big precedent. It makes the Supreme Court co-equal. Uh, the Barbary Wars. This is another one where it's like, is, is Jefferson being hypocritical or not, or is he following his principles? He is a big fan of making sure the United States uh, is respected, but the Barbary Wars have to do it. Is, again, I'm giving you lots of examples. If you're like, I've never covered this. My book doesn't talk about it. That's okay. My textbook doesn't really cover it enough either. Uh, but I try to tell my students about this just as another example. There are some pirates off the, co the Barbary coast, which is modern day Tripoli, some pirates off the coast who are interfering with our trade. So again, notice this theme of we're trying to trade with people and we keep getting attacked. So yeah, pirates, kind of crazy. Uh, there are some pirates that are attacking American shipping. And so in response, we send some American Navy, Navy boats over there to try to stop them and to make them stop attacking our ships. This seems kind of weird because at the same time that we're doing this, Jefferson is also trying to cut down on the Navy in order to make the United States government smaller because he doesn't think it should be as large. 
So is the first Barbary War something that's a little bit uh, hypocritical because he's expanding the role of the government by sending troops overseas? By the way, this is when you get the uh, Marine hymn. If anyone knows about this, it starts off, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. This is the Tripoli part. So we sent U.S. Marines overseas to Tripoli, which is a, a country in Tunisia, a city in Tunisia, to try to stop these pirates, and it becomes part of the Marines' uh, song. So Barbary Wars, is that Jefferson expanding the role of the federal government too much? It remains to be seen, but just another, another aftermath that we could potentially talk about. There's the Embargo Act, a reminder that during this time, the Embargo uh, Act is going to apply to all trade. This is the buildup to the War of 1812, where France and England are both attacking us again when we're trying to trade with both of them. And Jefferson says, okay, fine. If you're going to be attacking our ships, how about this? We are not going to trade with anybody. That doesn't go so well. Turns out that not trading with people is terrible for your economy. But... Could this be seen as Jefferson being consistent and saying, oh, yeah, um, we don't necessarily need a whole lot of trade. We can just do it internally, right? Agricultural, agrarian. Or is it Jefferson being a little bit more uh, hypocritical because he's expanding the role of the government to stop people from trading? He's interfering with free trade. Wow, that's huge government interference, right? And so some people are in the chat being like, oh, no, shake my head. This is bad for everybody. Yeah, it's not a good idea. And especially who's not going to like it? Who is especially opposed to Jefferson and especially involved in trade and thus really loses out when the Embargo Act comes into effect in 1807? By the way, while we're waiting on someone to type that out, embargo spelled backwards is oh, grab me. And remember, there's that famous oh, grab me cartoon that you may or may not see on a test at some point. Uh, yeah, where are most of those merchants? Geographically speaking, in the United States, where are most of the merchants going to be? The North, New England. And guess what? What that is also a Federalist stronghold. And so the Federalists in New England are going to be really, really cranky about this. The War of 1812 eventually breaks out, and there's a whole bunch of sequence of events that lead from the Embargo Act to the War of 1812. Uh, again, probably a, a discussion for another time, unless people have a lot of questions about that. Uh, but basically, we decide that uh, England is our bigger threat. France is not attacking us quite as much. And England is attacking us, and they're impressing our soldiers. They're kidnapping them. And there's the Chesapeake Leopard Affair. There's the Non-Intercourse Act. There's Macon's Bill Number 2. There's the British helping out Native Americans on the frontier to attack us. There's all sorts of problems. But needless to say, the War of 1812 happens. By this point, Jefferson is no longer president, although maybe he contributed to it. And who is president instead during the War of 1812? Madison. Nice job, Dominique. Well done, well done. Madison is president. And remember, Madison used to be Jefferson's secretary of state. So one could argue that they are going to sort of be a direct effect from the election of 1800 because Madison wouldn't become president unless Jefferson was as well. Yeah, Landon says, hmm, maybe Britain is mad at us for something. Uh, what do you think they'd be mad at us for? Actually, that's a good question. Why is Britain kind of mad at us? Why are they going to war with us in 1812? Is it because the United States just decides to declare war on them? I mean, that's not good. Uh, yeah, it turns out that there's this thing called the Revolutionary War, and they're a little bit salty still, absolutely. They don't like the fact that we left, and they see this as kind of a chance to retake us or perhaps just teach us a lesson. A lesson. So uh, remember how we said the Federalists were really mad about this, right? They want their colonies, uh, yeah, they want their colonies back. Uh, the Federalists were really worried about the War of 1812. They did not like it. They thought it was bad for trade. They did not vote for it. A lot, many of the so-called war hawks, the people that are in favor of going to war, they're coming from the South and the West. Henry Clay, for instance, from Kentucky. And the Federalists in New England are very opposed to this. So one of the things that happens afterwards is going to be the Hartford Convention. The Hartford Convention meets in 1814, and then it's going to deliver its demands to Washington, D.C. by 1815. Now, again, this is talking about election of 1800 and its aftermath. The reason this is a big deal is because the Hartford Convention leads to the demise of the Federalist Party. It's one of those, like, a push important things that happens. Largely in, in American history, many people don't know about this, but in a push, this is rather important. So in Hartford, Connecticut, a bunch of Federalists meet, and they say, 
uh, this war was bad and it's because we got outnumbered and being classic Federalists who are a little bit elitist, they say we know what's best and we'd also like to make it a little bit less democratic. So they push for super majorities that is more than 50% of Congress to be necessary in order to declare war because remember the War of 1812 was declared, our first declared war with just a lot of Southern and Western votes from Congress and thus not a whole lot of New England co uh, Congress people voted for it. And they're trying to make sure that this cannot happen again. But here's the problem. Their timing is really, really terrible. In Washington, D.C., they get three pieces of news in sequence. One, they get news of the Treaty of Ghent, the treaty that ends the, the War of 1812. Now, it returns everything to normal. It returns to what's the fancy term is status quo antebellum, a.k.a. the way things were before the war. So we don't win anything, but we also didn't lose. And so we stood up to the British. Everyone's feeling really America. There's a lot of national sentiment. There's a lot of good feeling going on. Uh, ooh, sh shouldn't use that phrase. But there's a lot of, um, yeah, America. <laughs> there's a lot of nationalism going on, a lot of national pride. People are feeling like America has stood up for itself again and we're a big deal on the world stage. That's a piece of news number one. Piece of news number two, as a bonus, we discover a smashing victory over the British that actually happened after the Treaty of Ghent was signed, but they didn't know that yet because, of course, it took so long to cross the ocean with news, no telegraphs or anything yet. And as Dominique and Vicky are already telling us, yes, Andrew Jackson and his smashing victory over the British at the Battle of New Orleans. And that means that not only... Have we not lost and we've proved ourselves and America? We also beat the British in a little bit of a bonus round, just absolutely wiped the floor with them. It was no contest. And it was, again, another thing that boosted American pride. Then the third piece of news is going to be, oh, a bunch of whiny Federalists up in New England are threatening to secede, that is, leave the country, commit treason, if they're not given their way. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I mean, my goodness. Right? This is going to be really, really bad timing. This is not a good time to be talking about nullification and states' rights and dominion of New England. Yes, yes. <laughs> good, good connection there, Dominique. Yeah. Uh, this is not a good time to be complaining against what the government has just done because we won. I mean, granted, War of 1812, probably a tie. Really, the only people that have a change are the Indians. They're the losers in this. Uh, but again, even if we didn't necessarily win, we felt like we won. And so this American sentiment is growing. And there's a bunch of whiny New England Federalists that are like, oh, we want it to be different. Ah, we didn't like this. So their timing is awful. And thus, after the Hartford Convention, the Federalist Party really goes downhill. In fact, we're going to say Federalists rest in peace after 1815. Realistically speaking, they're not going to be able to field a candidate by the 1820s uh, for president. There are some Federalists that hang on in Congress for a while. But this is going to lead us eventually toward a time period when we don't really have a Federalist Party anymore. And everyone is essentially a Democratic Republican of some sort. And thus, we're going to be entering with James Monroe, the era of good feelings, as Dominique just said. Yes. So all of that can be tied back to the election of 1800. So just some arguments as to what happens. Let me show you a timeline real quick to kind of re review what we were talking about. So remember, before 1800, we're going to have Adams' presidency. We're going to have the quasi-war. We're going to have problems with France and the Alien and Sedition Acts that make him really unpopular. And the election of 1800 right there in the middle, that's going to be a big deal in for a variety of reasons in the middle of that screen. And then afterwards, we have the last election with a Federalist candidate for president in 1816. And then... War of 1812 and all of its aftermath, etc. Just giving you a kind of a, a sense of that timeline of what we talked about. So the road to 1800 and the road after 1800 looks a little bit like this. So some evaluation questions that we should ask if we're talking about, is the election of 1800 actually a turning point? One of them would be, was it a revolution? Jefferson sometimes calls it a revolution. The, the election of 1800 was the revolution of 1800. A little bit of hyperbole. But is it actually a revolution? Why or why not? Be able to support your answer. Second question, and kind of related, was Jefferson actually Jeffersonian? We talk about the age of Jeffersonian democracy, a.k.a. small towns. Uh, we're talking more agrarian. We're talking smaller government. Is Jefferson actually Jeffersonian? Right? Is, is he actually Jeffersonian? That's a great question to ask. And then, lastly... We got to ask this question. How did the U.S. government continue to be divided by party post-1800? 
when we're talking about dividing by different kinds of parties, uh, it's usually going to be Federalists and Democratic Republicans, but does it go away, right? Does it go away after 1800? No, it's still there. Is it any different? Maybe, could be. So is the U.S. government divide change because of the election of 1800? That might be one criteria we could use to talk about uh, whether or not the election of 1800 is actually a, uh, a turning point or not. Let's see. I think there was a, a question here. Um, let's see if I can get to that in a second. So who was the who was the last Federalist candidate for president? Oh, shoot. Um, I'm trying to think about what that is. Um, I'm going to have to look that one up. Sorry about that. Um, I think it's I think it's Rufus King, if I remember correctly. But don't don't quote me on that. Somebody check me out. But uh, I believe it's going to be Rufus King. Yeah. So the the last candidate, Federalist candidate for uh, president is going to be Rufus King in 1816. Oh, Zachary checked it out. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, we're correct. All right. Sounds good. So those are three questions to ask about when it comes to is the election of 1800 a turning point? Is it a revolution? Does it lead to a whole bunch of bloodshed? No, not in that sense. Is it a revolution in terms of being a new system of government where we peacefully transition power? Sure. Um, but is it? does it lead to radical shifts in the government style? Do we have big government before and after? Yeah, a little bit. Uh, does Jefferson do some things that could be considered hypocritical? Sure. Does he change his strict constructionism to loose constructionism once he gets power? Yeah, also that's true. Uh, that, so then is Jefferson Jeffersonian, a little bit of yes and no. Louisiana Purchase, kind of sketchy constitutionally, but also a great opportunity for spreading his so-called empire of liberty with small agrarian yeoman farmers everywhere. Wow. And then does the U.S. government continue to be divided by party? Absolutely. Does it change after 1800? Maybe. There are some Federalists. There are some Democratic Republicans. There's still some issues over big government, small government. There's still some sectional divides between New England and the South, right? A variety of areas. So overall, is the election of 1800 a big turning point? Sure, for a variety of reasons. Is it a revolution? Most historians say, I'm not sure it qualifies as a revolution, but that depends on how you use the term, and it's a little bit of a quibble there. So questions or concerns that I can help to answer here. We're still here for another 10 minutes or so, and so, hey, I'm available for you. I'm an A-push teacher, and you're A-push students. What can I help you with? Are you talking about the election of 1800? Do you want to know more about Thomas Jefferson? Were there some events that we mentioned tonight that were a little bit too quick for you? And were you like, oh, man, I'm not necessarily sure about this whole War of 1812 thing. Uh, Landon was mentioning westward expansion. Do we want to talk a little bit more about that? The election of 1800 is a turning point. But if we don't have any questions, I do have a couple more things we could talk about here. Otherwise, uh, we'll, we'll let you put those in the chat. Let me, let me go back a little bit to some of these uh, aftermath discussions here. Um, so particularly the War of 1812. Let's talk about that since that's probably one of the biggest impacts of the election of 1800 because we're going to go to war with Britain and not with France. So again, if you have more questions, feel free to put those in the chat. But otherwise, let's do some War of 1812 review. Keep in mind that there are three historical thinking skills in APUSH that you're going to want to keep in mind as you take notes as you pay attention to your textbook, as you pay attention to your teacher, and as you study for tests. Uh, by the way, anybody know those three historical thinking skills? You can go ahead and drop those in the chat if you think you know what they are. They all begin with C. I'll give you that hint. Contextualization is a skill, yes. Um, it's not gonna be the main historical thinking skills, the three ones, but it's a part of it, for sure. As in, what else is going on in the time period and it also begins with C. That's pretty confusing. Okay, Dominique, why don't we just say there are four? <laughs> I liked your answer. Um, Alvin mentions continuity and change. Yes. Sometimes we're abbreviated as CCOT, change and continuity over time. How do things change over time? How do they stay the same over time? War of 1812 is a great example of that. Uh, let's see. Contextualization could work. Comparison, says Vicky. That's one. Yep. Compare and contrast. So particularly the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists. And the last one is causation, indeed. All right. So the War of 1812, you can look at this through a variety of lenses. You can look at this through a comparison 
So you could talk about the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans and how they were both responded to this. Probably not the best one. one of the ones that would be better would be continuity and change over time. How does the United States respond to the French Revolution? How does the United States respond to British impressment? And how does it change over time? It seems like the affairs kind of escalate. At first, you get kind of the, hey, stop impressing us. And then you get the, we're going to not trade with you. And then you get the Leopard and Chesapeake incidents. And you get a whole bunch of uh, fighting that happens. Another one would be causation. What causes the War of 1812? So uh, let's talk about that just a little bit more. So as Jefferson is president and he is interested in making sure that we're not getting attacked as much and having our soldiers kidnapped by the British, a process known as in- impressment, um, he's gonna, we're, we're going to pass a variety of bills that are going to try to compel the British to stop their uh, orders in council that, that allow them to be able to kidnap our sailors and attack our ships. So the first one is, like we said here, the Embargo Act of 1807. That just says no trade with anybody. And uh, yikes, kind of harsh. Remember, we said that that hurts the Federalists. The second one is going to be the so-called Non-Intercourse Act. And that says intercourse, by the way, in the sense of like exchanging goods and interacting with. And that says, look, we're not going to trade with either of you folks because you're just too bad. So fine, fine, fine. We're not going to do the Embargo Act, Not no trade with anybody. But how about no trade with England and France? Well, it turns out that doesn't really work either because they still attack us. And those are our two major trading partners. So it still really doesn't help our economy. So then there's this thing passed called Macon's Bill Number 2. Macon's Bill Number 2 says, oh, okay, 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 we get it. We have to trade with England or France, but we want to have some sort of compulsion, some sort of way to make them not attack us anymore. So here, how about this? Whoever stops attacking us, we will put an embargo on the other European power, and then we'll just trade with you. So French, if you stop attacking us, we'll put an embargo on Britain, and we'll just trade with the French. British, same deal goes with you. Britain, if you stop attacking us, then we will embargo the French and just trade with the British. Allegedly, the French say, okay, fine, we'll stop attacking you. And so then we put an embargo on England, and that leads to the War of 1812. The French really didn't, and they were being a little bit duplicitous, being a little bit tricky there. Uh, They didn't quite stop it, but we didn't quite know that at the time. And so that's going to lead to the War of 1812, because we're going to be putting an embargo on on the British and then fighting back. And eventually we're going to declare war, especially because we think that the British are helping out the Native Americans out west. And a lot of those war hawks are in Kentucky and other places out west that are bordering with the Native Americans. So when you talk about continuity and change over time, talk about how it gets in, the rhetoric gets increasingly warlike as the years go on, how the concern for American shipping is continuous, but how the focus perhaps shifts or the way that they're going to use compulsion might shift. Jeffersonian Methods might include economic coercion as opposed to direct military involvement. So in that sense, maybe Jefferson is being pretty Jeffersonian. Um, But the War of 1812 is going to be a big deal because, again, like we mentioned, it's kind of like the second American revolution. It leads to a whole bunch of nationalism, and it's going to lead to us feeling like we're kind of a big deal on the the world stage. Yeah. So War of 1812 is a really, really important thing to keep in mind during Madison's presidency, and it's an important – aftermath of the election of 1800. Let me go back then to before the election of 1800. And one more time, talk about this road to 1800, because there's a couple things that I wanted to clarify here one more time. Keep in mind, as we mentioned, the Adams presidency is going to be plagued by international affairs, just like the Jefferson administration is going to be. There's still this problem of England versus France. The War of 1812 was against England. The quasi war was against France. So you got to keep that in mind. And then the Alien and Sedition Acts are going to be part of a long, long history in American history of having this question of how much power and civil liberties should we have during wartime? Should the government be able to restrict you during wartime? Should you be able to have fewer civil liberties during wartime? Should you have just as many? What are we actually fighting for if the government can just take all your stuff from you? So the Alien and Sedition Acts are going to be a really big part of this well, you could almost say it's a, it's a change in continuity over time, but I was going to say like a comparison. You could compare this to, say, after 9-11 when we passed the Patriot Act that allows the government to spy on you. Well, maybe it's necessary to keep us safe. Maybe it's government overreach. Maybe it interferes with the First Amendment. Maybe it's going too far. There, there's some interesting debates there, and that would make some good fodder for a comparison essay or so, other such things. That was the other thing that I wanted to talk about was, was those uh, historical thinking skills. Any other 
questions. Mary, I'm glad you liked the PowerPoint. Good. <laughs> um, any other questions that I can help to answer as we wrap up here? I'll, I'll give you some time to throw some things in the chat. Let me just mention a couple of other things. Um, when it comes to comparison or contrast, actually, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions are a great thing to add for the Democratic Republicans, whereas the Marbury v. Madison is going to be much more of a federalist idea. So how do you make sure that laws are not const that are unconstitutional don't get passed? One theory is state nullification, and that's Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. That will come up again. The cough, cough, South Carolina, cough, cough the uh, problems with Jackson and then actually later even on the Civil War um, because Northern states are going to try to nullify some laws before the Civil War, such as the Fugitive Slave Act. So a lot of these things that are happening early, early in our nation's history are going to become really, really important later in history because they establish really important precedents, really important uh, patterns that we're going to see again. So eight, uh, the election of 1800 arguably could be considered a turning point because it establishes the precedent of the precedent that the president is going to give up power, even if it's the opposite party. Uh, there's things going on on either side of it where it's it's very clear that uh, big things are happening. It sets the trend, absolutely, as Lyndon was saying. Uh, it, it's going to make sure that we're going to, well, unfortunately, they don't deal with a whole lot of things. They kind of kick them down the road. So it's going to make sure that we're going to have to deal with some of this stuff again. Um, let's talk real quick then about Marbury v. Madison. So let me go back to that. Um, Marbury v. Madison with judicial review. Reminder, John Marshall, who was an important ambassador for the United States at times, including during the XYZ affair, he's the chief justice. And John Marshall is going to be important as we move forward because he's going to outlast Jefferson. He's going to outlast Madison and Monroe and is still going to be chief justice when Jackson is there. And Jackson, Andrew Jackson and um, John Marshall are going, to, are going to clash a whole lot. Yeah, uh, it's it's a great Supreme Court case. I mean, it establishes the principle of judicial review, right? Without Marbury v. Madison, you don't have a Supreme Court that is co-equal with, with the other branches. And again, that's another good example of a CCOT. Uh, because, my goodness, Supreme Court cases are huge in Bush. You got to know those. Yeah, it gives the Supreme Court its teeth. Good way to put it, Mary. Yes. Um, let's see. Abofu says... Uh, ways in which Thomas Jefferson contributed to a stable government after the ratification of the Constitution. Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, you know, I would I would say keep in mind Jefferson is not a part of the Constitutional Convention itself, right? He's off in France, being our minister to France, which is, which is hugely important. Uh, but he is kept apprised of the situation. He's kept informed by James Madison and other people that are in the Constitutional Convention. So one of the ways he contributes to stable government is that he supports Washington. I mean, he volunteers. Remember this idea of small R republicanism, where people are going to volunteer for things and be able to serve their country? Um, Jefferson says, yeah, I'm willing to serve as Secretary of State. I've been an important diplomat. I'm willing to serve. This way he lends another, another big name to the first presidency, to the legitimacy of Washington and his cabinet. So Washington is just absolutely stacked with a whole bunch of people in his cabinet and in Congress. All the, a lot of the founding fathers are going to be there. And uh, it's, it's going to be rather important for Jefferson to be able to lend his voice, his pen at times, to Washington's legitimacy. So he doesn't play a huge role during the, during the Washington administration uh, before, before, like, the well, he's not a part of the ratification process per se. And then during Washington's first term, it's largely just him and Hamilton arguing about Hamilton's financial plan. Uh, but he contributes to the stability just by being there and not leaving, not contributing to a coup. And also maybe even indirectly by not doing things like the, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions openly. By doing it secretly, he's trying to argue it based on constitutional grounds and not based on a personal vendetta against Adams. So in that sense, it's, it's a little bit admirable for sure. Uh, one last thing that I wanted to mention before we close this off here. Yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Thanks to Bofu. Um, one last thing that I wanted to mention before we close off is going to be uh, the election of 1800. We're talking a lot about political changes and important changes for really, really big, important people. One of the most important things to keep in mind, as you'll see in some streams that we have coming up here on, on Fiveable, is that you want to be always looking to the margins, right? You want to be keeping, out, keeping an eye out for people that perhaps don't have all the political power. At this point, we're talking about Native Americans, women, and African Americans especially. Does the election of 1800 change their lives a whole lot? Not really. That's an example of continuity over time. So the election of 1800 might be considered a turning point 
only if you're talking about rich white dudes. And so that's one thing to keep in mind. And that's a great way, uh, not only to keep your, your mind on, uh, okay, uh, how can we be fighting for justice in the, in the contemporary world based on history, but also that can add some nuance to your essays. So if you're talking about an essay where it's mostly just about Jeffersonian democracy, we'll mention some of those groups that you don't first think of when you think of democracy because they didn't have the power. Democracy and not giving power, that's a part of democracy too. So don't 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 forget about that. Uh, think about as as Abigail Adams said. Remember the ladies, and then don't forget about the Native Americans, particularly with the War of eighteen twelve, and then also be thinking about uh, African Americans at this time too. Yeah, power and politics, as Mary was mentioning, power and politics uh, is one of those apush themes, and you got to keep in mind. Unfortunately, the power is often restricted, especially early in the American Republic, and politics is the purview of only some of the really really powerful at first. I just want to use some alliteration there. Politics is the purview of the powerful, a.k.a. those that are rich and wealthy and influential. They get to be invested at first, but it's going to gradually, gradually expand. And that's what we'll get to when we talk about Andrew Jackson and the expansion of democracy. So I'm not seeing any other questions, and it's about that time. So thank you. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thanks for participating in the chat, for asking questions. Questions are always appreciated. Thanks for answering questions. Thanks for being participatory. It always works better that way. And hopefully you either learned something or it was really, really helpful review for you. Best of luck in a push. Remember, you've got what it takes. You've, you're armed with some fiveable videos. You're armed with your knowledge. You're armed with your hard work. Thank you for visiting. Thanks for saying thank you. And we'll have a good night. Uh, see you next time. All right. Have a good evening.